This is the second part of my talk uh, in which I explain how the Rutland or Patlack plot can be used to process the Renogram. I'm now going to talk about the theory. In part one I gave an introduction and talked about the background subtraction problem and a little bit about the history of the Patlack or Rutland plot. Now in part two I'm going to discuss the theory of the Rutland plot and explain how it can be thought of as an idealised constant infusion renogram. Mike Rutland's paper of 1985 describes a comprehensive analysis of the renogram in two parts. He shows how you can analyse the first pass data to give the renal blood flow and the uptake phase to give the renal clearance. In what I'm discussing here, I'm only considering the uptake phase. So you can apply this method to any renogram. You don't need to have first pass data uh, in order to uh, use what I'm discussing here. Now in his paper, Mike went into the mathematical details and I'll come to that later. But I find it helpful to think of it as a simulation. Uh, this isn't what Mike discussed in his paper, but I find it helpful and I hope that you will too. Now, the real renogram is the response of the kidney to a single intravenous injection. So it results in a blood activity that's continually falling because we inject into the blood and the activity starts high, but as the kidneys remove the activity, the blood activity falls all the time. But imagine what the renogram would look like if we were able to give a constant infusion. So instead of a single intravenous injection, we continually infuse more uh, radio pharmaceutical into the patient in order to top up the blood activity uh, in order to keep it constant instead of letting it fall all the time. Now in that case we will get a rather different shaped renogram but I like to think of the Rutland method as predicting what that constant infusion renogram would look like. Uh, it takes the real renogram from the intravenous injection and the corresponding blood curve and mathematically manipulates them to simulate what this constant infusion injection would look like. So that's the idea that I'm going to talk about now. So I'm going to look at a model of what the renogram uh, would look like after a normal intravenous injection. I'm going to consider activity in four different compartments within the body. Uh, initially, uh, activity within the, the blood itself, uh, and then activity in, in extravascular tissues, that's everything outside the, the blood, uh, and that's because these traces can diffuse out of the blood into the extravascular tissues, and they can also freely diffuse back again. These traces are obviously excreted from the blood into the kidney so we we look at activity within the kidney the tubules and the renal pelvis and eventually passing on into the bladder so when we inject all the activity goes into the blood so we start with a high concentration in the blood and these four graphs are going to show how the concentration changes with time after that injection so after we inject, this high concentration in the blood uh, begins to fall rapidly. Uh, it falls for two reasons. First of all, because it's moving from the blood into the extravascular tissues. And secondly, because it's being excreted from the blood into the kidneys. So we start off with a high concentration in the blood, which then falls. The concentration in the kidney obviously started at zero, but it uh, rises for the first few minutes. Uh, it takes a few minutes for the activity to pass through the tubules and pelvis before it can enter the bladder, but after maybe three or four minutes, the activity in the kidney begins to fall and it moves on into the bladder. Now all this time, the activity in the uh, blood is falling and the activity in the extravascular tissues is rising. So sooner or later there must come a time when the concentration in the tissue is higher than the concentration in the blood. And at that time we get a net diffusion back again from the tissues into the blood. So the tissue reaches a maximum and begins to come down again uh, and the blood which had been falling continues to fall but not as quickly. Uh, the kidney continues to go down and the bladder goes up. And eventually if we wait long enough all the activity ends up in the, in the bladder. So this model says that after a normal intravenous injection, we get a tissue concentration that starts at zero, rises to a maximum and comes down again. A blood concentration which starts high and falls rapidly at first and then less quickly as time goes on. 
uh, kidney activity which starts at zero, rises to a peak in a gentle curve and then comes down again. Uh, the reason it's a curve is because the rate at which it appears in the kidney depends on how much there is in the blood. The more there is in the blood, the faster it comes into the kidney. So when the blood is high concentration, the kidney is rising rapidly, and as the blood concentration comes down, the rate of rise of the kidney begins to flatten off a bit. So this is a gentle curve before it reaches a peak and then comes down again. And the bladder gives a delay before it goes up. So that's the shape of the curves predicted by this model after an intravenous injection. So if we look at the raw renogram curves, um, we shall get a curve like this from our kidney region of interest. Uh, it's three components within that. Obviously we get the activity within the kidney itself from the renal tubules and the uh, renal pelvis. Um, uh, but we also inevitably get some blood because we can't avoid uh, the blood which is in the kidney. The kidney is a very vascular organ and also some tissue background from tissues that lie in the patient's back between the kidney and the gamma camera because those will also be within our kidney region of interest. So for the kidney region we expect all three components like that. If we draw a blood region of interest around somewhere that's very vascular, we hope to get uh, a curve like the, the blood component, but once again, we can't avoid having some tissue background as well within that. And so we get a curve from the blood region, which is a composite of a lot of blood and a little, little tissue. If we also try to find another region of interest, which is predominantly tissue, we expect to get something like this, which is um, less blood and more tissue, but again, a composite curve. So the first stage of the background subtraction will be to subtract the, the tissue background. So if we take this curve representing the, the tissue background and subtract it from the blood region, um, it's reasonable to assume that the uh, tissue components in each of those are the same counts per pixel because the tissues um, in our blood region and our tissue region are going to be much the same. So all we need to do is to scale those according to the number of uh, pixels in the region of interest because the counts per pixel should be the same. We can do the same thing to subtract the tissue from the, the kidney region, once again just scaling for the relative size of the regions of interest. And so that allows us to subtract the tissue uh, from the kidney, hopefully uh, leaving just the kidney and the, the blood. So uh, that's the straightforward bit of doing the subtraction. We subtract the, the tissue background, just assuming that the counts per pixel from the tissue are the same in all of these regions, which is a reasonable assumption. So hopefully we should now end up with tissue background subtracted curves that look like this. From the blood region of interest, after we subtract the tissue background, we just get a blood-shaped curve. And from the kidney region of interest, after we subtracted the tissue background, we get a composite of blood and kidney activity. Now, the next stage of the processing is to divide one curve by the other. We divide this background subtracted kidney region curve by this background subtracted blood region curve. And you'll see here in the kidney curve, we've got in the kidney curve, we've got a blood shaped background. And in the blood region, we've got a blood shaped background. So if we divide that by that, they're the same shape. So they should give a constant. So what we end up with um, is a uh, constant blood background. So this is a way of forcing the blood background to be constant rather than, than falling. But what we've done, instead of plotting counts on the vertical axis, we've now plotted kidney divided by blood. One consequence of that is that the uh, kidney curve, which did rise in a curve here that gradually flattened off as it got towards the peak, uh, now having divided by the blood goes the other way and it goes in a rather peculiar shape like that. But never mind about that for, for the moment. So we've changed the y-axis from counts into kidney counts divided by blood counts. And that's given us a blood background, which is now constant. Um, so the next stage is to uh, stretch the time axis so that we change the time axis from normal time into Rutland time, which is a sort of stretch time. And it stretches it in such a way that this curve here turns into a straight line. And that makes this graph much easier to interpret. Oh, this is what we would call the Rutland plot. And the nice thing about it is that the 
uh, constant activity here, the intercept at where the curve starts, tells us exactly how much blood background there is, uh, and it's a constant. And the slope here, which we can call the uptake constant, shows the, the kidney function. So instead of having a, a real renogram with a blood background that changes all the time and a slope of the renogram rising which is not a straight line but a curve we've now got a constant blood background and a linear rise of the activity with time. We can illustrate that that's the same thing as a constant infusion renogram with this uh, version of the compartmental model. Instead of giving uh, a bolus intravenous injection into the blood, I'm now going to assume we've got a continuous infusion which keeps the blood activity constant. So after we start the infusion, the activity in the blood will now remain constant because we're topping it up all the time. The activity in the tissue, again, will start from zero uh, and rise, and in the kidney it will start from zero and rise. But unlike the real renogram, where the activity rises in a curve, it will now rise in a straight line because we have a constant activity in the blood, so every minute the same amount comes into the kidney, so it rises the same amount. Um, it still takes a few minutes before activity begins to get through the kidney and come out into the bladder. But when it does, the activity in the kidney will flatten off um, because as much is coming in from the blood as is going out into the bladder. So we expect the um, kidney activity to rise in a straight line and then level off and remain constant thereafter. And the blood activity remains constant. So this is what the model says for the constant in fusion renogram. So if we compare the two situations we can see that in the real renogram following a normal intravenous injection we get a blood activity that falls with time leading to a kidney activity uh, superimposed on a falling blood activity which is the normal renogram. If we do a constant infusion renogram, we would have a constant activity in the blood, leading to a constant blood background uh, in this idealized renogram, and a linear rise of activity with time before it flattens off. But we don't need to give a constant infusion because the Rutland method takes the blood curve and the kidney curve from the real renogram and mathematically distorts it into this graph which is the Rutland plot which is the simulation if you like of this constant infusion renogram. And whereas the real renogram is difficult to quantify because the blood activity in the background is changing with time and the rise here is a gentle curve which is difficult to, uh, m to measure, uh, the constant infusion renogram or the Rutland plot has a nice constant blood background which is easy to determine from this point at the origin here and a nice linear rise of activity with time which is easy to quantify. Now the theory that Mike Rutland described in his uh, paper is a bit more uh, mathematical for those who want to have the mathematics here is his version of it. Um, if we define the blood activity uh, to be B, which is the counts from our vascular region of interest, having subtracted off the counts from a tissue region of interest, scaling just for the region size, as I said, to subtract the background, and kidney activity K is the counts in the kidney region, also with tissue counts subtracted after scaling for region size. So B and K are tissue background subtracted counts in the blood and kidney regions. First of all we have to assume, assume that the input rate into the kidney is proportional to B. In other words, the more trace there is in the blood, the more uptake there is into the kidney and that's a reasonable assumption. And we also assume that uh, it takes a few minutes before anything leaves the kidney and again that's a sensible assumption because it takes a minimum of a few minutes for tracer to pass through the tubule before it can leave the kidney. So uh, if these are true, then the counts in the kidney must be proportional to the amount that's been presented to it in the blood. In other words, the counts in the kidney are some uptake constant times the integral of the blood, the total amount of blood activity that's been presented. So UC here is an uptake constant that represents the function of the kidney. 
We then assume that the blood background is proportional to B. So it's A, some background subtraction factor, times the blood activity. Now it must be true that the kidney uh, count K is the true count plus this blood background um, and we can say that the true kidney counts here are UC times the integral of B and the blood background we've just assumed is A times B so we get this for K. Uh, that means if we divide through by B we get K over B is UC times the integral of B over B plus A and that you will recognize as the equation of a straight line. Um, if we're plotting k over b against the integral of b over b, we end up with a straight line with slope equal to uc and intercept equal to a, which is mathematically saying that the uh, Rutland plot is the graph of k over b on the vertical axis against integral of b over b uh, on the horizontal axis um, and that's uh, going to have a slope equal to uc and intercept equal to a. And this thing, the integral of b over b, is what I like to call Rutland time as a more convenient way of describing it. So what we've seen is that the Rutland plot is basically a mathematical manipulation of the Renogram that simulates what would happen if the blood activity was, was constant. And the Rutland plot is obtained by taking the kidney counts divided by blood counts on the vertical axis and Rutland time, which was this stretched or distorted uh, time, the integral of B over B uh, for the horizontal axis. And that gives us a constant blood background and a linear uptake so we can easily measure the slope of the straight line as a measure of the kidney function and we can use the intercept to tell us how much blood background to subtract for any individual kidney. So that's an explanation of how the Rutland plot works. So uh, in part three I'll go on to show how it's used in practice.